بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so as I had mentioned last week inshallah ta'ala we are done with the battles and the political conquests and inshallah we're going to go back to the basically the biography and other aspects of Umar bin Khattab's life and I want to begin by talking a little bit about um, the lifestyle and humility and uh, statements that we have from him that demonstrate how uh, if you like, simple and how ascetic he was. And the issue with Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu is that we have so much information really. He was the Khalifa for 10 years during the pinnacle of Islam, during the time of great peace and harmony, that you know when there's peace and harmony, you have a lot of riwayat from the people. And you have so many incidents that are narrated. So I have to actually sift through and decide what is basically possible for us. Otherwise, the fact of the matter is that we can spend days and days just talking about the statements that we have from him. and certain certain, uh, if you like, manifestations of, it, of his asceticism. So today we're going to talk about his lifestyle and asceticism and also uh, some aspects of his legal positions that we should be aware of. So Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh, it is well known that he was a very humble person uh, who always demonstrated humility. And this is even with regards to his own Islamic opinions. Uh, in one of the narrations that uh, I came across today, uh, it is said that he was asked a question. He sent the question to other people, said, go ask somebody else. So he went and asked Zayd ibn Thabit and Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib. And then he came back to Umar ibn Khattab and told him the verdicts that he had received from the other two. So Umar thought for a while and said, you know, if I would have answered your question, I would have said X, Y, and Z, something else. So the man said, you are the Khalifa, so why don't you make this the position of the Ummah? And Umar ibn Khattab said, if I were enforcing the Quran or the Sunnah, then I would do so. But I'm telling you my opinion, and you are telling me the opinion of Ali and Zayd. Meaning this is an ijtihad I have, they have their ijtihad. And this shows us the tolerance of fiqh that uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu had. It is also reported in the khutbah that he gave, that there's a, a, fa a phrase that he said in this khutbah, which is a very powerful phrase. He said, the most beloved of you to me are those who are able to point my errors out. The most beloved of you to me are those who are able to point my errors out. And this demonstrates again that he wanted the people to correct him. And it is interesting to note that, you know, we see, read in the seerah so many times that he said to the Prophet, should I not cut his head off? Or he's getting so, if you like, quick tempered. But you know, it's pretty clear that when you read his biography as a Khalifa, that he understood that he can no longer act upon that quick temper. And in fact, he seems to have controlled more when he had the opportunity to do whatever he wanted. And this is subhanAllah the sunnah of Allah in, in his creation that people, uh, when they are actually tested, people of Iman, when they're actually tested, they rise up and they pass that test in a manner that you would never have thought of beforehand. So how many times we think in the seerah that Umar ibn Khattab is going to execute so and so, so and so, so and so. Now when he actually gets to power, how many people does he actually execute? None of them for his own anger. Look at that amazing contrast, right? And that is because obviously that now that he is in charge, he knows he has to temper that. And it is uh, reported that once when he was giving the khutbah, uh, somebody stood up and interrupted him and said, Fear Allah, O Umar. Ittaqillaha ya Umar. And this is of course a very, very, um, if you like, blunt thing to say. And this is the Khalifa. And this is a man interrupting the khutbah. So the other people, he's causing a commotion. The other people stood up and wanted to rebuke him. To which Umar ibn Khattab said, and what is the advice? Ittaqillah ya Umar. Umar ibn Khattab said, Wallahi, there is no good in me if I cannot take this advice. And there is no good in you if you don't allow him to give this advice. In other words, you know, and this is so true. That subhanAllah, when one of us gets irritated with somebody who say, Ittaqillah, the immediate response is, who are you to tell me? Why are you coming to me? Go mind your own business. Yet, and this is in the khutbah. This is in the khutbah. Somebody interrupts the khutbah. Fear Allah, O Umar. And Umar says, if I cannot take this advice, 
then there's no point in, in me being your leader. And if you don't allow him to give this advice to me, then there is no good in you as well. And in another khutbah, he was giving khutbah and of it he quoted the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that hear and obey your rulers, right? Sam'an wa ta'a. To which somebody stood up, interrupted and he said, La sam'an wa la ta'a. We shall neither hear nor obey you. Umar said, why? I mean, what have I done to deserve this? And subhanAllah, notice the zulm of Umar. Notice what he had done that this Bedouin or whatever gets angry at him. He says that, uh, to, to make a long story short, that in a certain uh, ghanima or uh, uh, war booty that had come, everybody's supposed to get an equal share. So he said, I got one piece of cloth from that uh, ghanima, and here you are wearing two pieces of that cloth, up and down. And you only gave us one piece. Means you have done dhulm upon all of us by taking double the share. Subhanallah, imagine this is why he's getting irritated with Umar, that you have not done justice, that allegedly you took one cloth more than what you have given us. So he was giving the khutbah, he said to his son Abdullah, stand up and tell him, Abdullah ibn Umar. So Abdullah stood up and said, this was my share, I gifted it to my father. This was my share, I gifted it to my father. But the point being that subhanAllah, well firstly the level, the standard that the people are putting him up to account for. Imagine if our rulers had this standard, one piece of cloth that he took. Our rulers steal 90% of the country for their pockets, right? And nobody can say anything. This is Umar, they are accusing him of taking one cloth and he doesn't get irritated because it is right. He has to answer to the people, where did I get this other cloth from? I shouldn't have gotten it. And his son says, it is actually my cloth. I was the one who gifted it to Umar. Now he has two uh, cloths. And we are all familiar with the famous story, which is well known, reported in a number of, of classical books, of him giving the khutbah when he said, why are you making your mahar so high? Lower your mahar. I am now going to set the maximum of 40 uqiyya. Uqiyya is an amount of silver. In other words, now the point here, Umar wanted to set a maximum so that marriage is easier. And wallahi, this is such a, a fiqh of Umar, that marriage is getting more and more difficult. And we know now that marriage is, is not as easy as Islamically it should be. That we have complicated the muhur, the, the, uh, the, the marriage ceremony, etc. Et so Umar ibn Khattab saying, I want to set a maximum limit. So that people can get married easier, so they don't fall into zina. So he said the maximum is 40 uqiyya. In the khutbah, the famous incident, and this is an authentic incident, the lady stands up. And this shows a lot about the fact she did not consider it to be a crime or a sin to stand up in the khutbah to correct Umar. And she said, you have no right, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, to set a limit. Now, of course, she's a lady. She wants maximum mahar. Fully understandable. It's her right. And she's like, you have no right to set a maximum amount. So Umar said, what do you mean I have no right? Then she quoted the verse in the Quran. That uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, when uh, 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 And if you have given to one of them, this is in the talaq, if you divorce the woman, then Allah says, if you had given a qintar, a treasure, do not take the treasure back. Will you take it back in clear dhulm and in clear evil and sin? Don't take your treasure back from her. So she is saying, Allah says he can give her a treasure. Who are you to say he can only give 40 uqiyya? Okay, very, very profound reasoning from the Quran. So at, at this point, Umar ibn Khattab said, the woman is correct or a woman is correct and Umar is wrong. Kullu nasi afqahu min Umar. He felt so like... You know how you feel sometimes when you're corrected in this manner. Uh, uh, not in this manner, none of us has been corrected maybe. But you get my point. When you're corrected so publicly and it's very clear that you are wrong, he really felt like, wow, that was a big mistake. So what did he say? Kullu nasi afqahu min Umar. Everybody is more knowledgeable than Umar ibn Khattab. Again, look at his humility here. Wallahi, nobody is more knowledgeable of his time than Umar. But everybody makes, you know, it's human errors and judgments. So he realizes this lady has a point, I am wrong. Notice here the humility of Umar on the mimbar, standing in public in front of the whole masjid. And a lady from the back yells out, basically, you're wrong, you have no right. And what does he do? You're absolutely right. You were the one that was correct. 
I was wrong, and to put himself down, Kullu nasi afqahu min uh, Umar. And Umar as well, of the things that demonstrate his humility uh, and his asceticism. Uh, remember when we talked about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, we mentioned that he was the one who told Abu Bakr, you have to take a salary. Remember, Abu Bakr wanted to go out to the marketplace. Now Abu Bakr is dead, Umar's in charge. Who's going to tell Umar he can take a salary? He could have just instituted because he's the Khalifa. But no, he sends his, his uh, servant to Uthman ibn Affan and to Ali ibn Abi Talib and to Sa'id ibn Zayd, basically the Ashara Mubashara, the, the elite of the Sahaba, that he knows is going to give them the authentic advice. And he says, you see my situation now. Do you think I have the right for Baytul Mal? I mean, subhanAllah, he does not need permission technically. He's the Khalifa. But to make sure he's doing something correct and to make sure the Muslims are aware. So he sends them the emissary and they all come back and they say, of course, this is your haq now to have a, tra a, a, a salary from Baytul Mal. Then he says, what should my salary be? What is the amount? So they said, you set the salary. What is the amount you want? So I said, no, I will tell you. And I think this is a pro appropriate salary. And he said, the salary should be that one garment in the summer, one garment in the winter, food for my family, and one animal to ride so that I can do the Hajj and Umrah on that animal. This is my salary. SubhanAllah, this is like a portion of a month's salary that we would have, you know. Food for my family, one cloth in the summer, one cloth in the winter. Every six months, I'll get a new piece of cloth, like a new thobe, okay? And one animal, so that uh, he go, uh, as the Khalifa in those days, in those days, the Khalifa went for Hajj every year. Every year, it was his responsibility. The Khulafa al-Rashidun, that was one of their roles they took on. Every year, they would go for Hajj, pretty much. And something happened, then they would send somebody. And this was a part of their response. So he said, one camel, so that I can go for the Hajj and come back on. And this salary, of course, I mean, if you compare it to, this is like a, a not even, this is a poverty level salary, right? No savings, zero savings. Food for my family is the salary. That is the salary, in essence. And one, one cloth in the summer and one cloth in the uh, winter. And so the Sahaba agreed to this and that was his salary, basically, until he passed away. He didn't get rich off of the Baytul Mal. Now, from this all of the scholars of Islam unanimously agreed, and this is the reality of the Ummah, that whoever is working for the Ummah on behalf of the Khalifa will get a salary from the Baytul Mal. So Umar bin Khattab basically opened this door, which is understood. And of course, this is something that is well understood and known, that those who are helping the Ummah, they will get their salary from the uh, Baytul Mal, and therefore all of the basically employees of the governments understood they were going to get their money from the Baytul Mal. And it is uh, also not mentioned in, in, uh, to demonstrate Umar ibn Khattab's uh, humility that once Ali ibn Abi Talib saw him leaving Medina. So he said, where are you going, O Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, one of the camels of Sadaqah has gone missing, so I want to go search for it. So Ali said, you have humiliated all future rulers after you. Meaning what? You have set the bar so high, nobody's going to be able to follow after you. This is Ali saying this. There's nobody that can li live, live up to this. So Umar ibn Khattab said, Ya Abu al-Hasan, Ya Abu al-Hasan, O Abu al-Hasan, don't criticize me in this indirect manner. For wallahi, if a small goat were to be taken from the side of the Euphrates, I fear that Allah might ask me about that goat. This is a famous you know, phrase we hear all the time. This is the context of what he said it in, right? It's like, it's like a semi-jest that Ali is saying that you're setting the bar so high, how can anybody live up to you after this? And so, and this is Umar and Ali, private conversation. Ali later on tells us. So Umar is saying, yeah, Abu al-Hasan, you know, jokes aside, if a small goat goes missing and the Euphrates, they had just conquered it right now. They had just conquered Iraq now. The furthest, and he had never, Umar, never went to Iraq. This is the furthest dominion. Saying if a goat went missing, a baby goat went missing, 
That was my responsibility. I'm worried Allah will ask me about it. How about a camel in Medina that is from the camels of charity? What if uh, you know, it goes missing and nobody finds it? And the fact of the matter is that uh, after taking over the, the caliphate, it appears that Umar bin Khattab lived an even rougher and even simpler lifestyle. That once he got that responsibility before Islam, he was middle class. And even during Islam, it appeared that he's living basically a middle class life. But once he becomes Khalifa, so he becomes so concerned with the affairs of the Ummah that in fact his standard of living actually goes down. One of the uh, Sahaba Abdullah bin Amir reported that one year I accompanied Umar ibn Khattab for Hajj from Medina to Mecca and back. And throughout the journey, throughout this whole trip, neither was any pavilion erected for him nor even a tent constructed he would put a cloth uh, on a branch of the tree and then another sheet underneath that and lie down to go to sleep this is not even roughing it out it's more than this this is the khalifa of the muslims and he doesn't even have a tent erected for him and it is well known that the khulafa al rashidun all of them they did not have bodyguards. This came later on. And they did not have private majalis that you could not have access to. Just like the Prophet ﷺ, all human beings could enter into the masjid and talk directly to the, to the Khalifa. Later on, and, and I have to say this, that subhanAllah, many Muslims have a romanticized notion of medieval Islam. There's no doubt it was better than now. There's no doubt. But believe you me, Majority of our Khulafa, of the Umayyads, Abbas's, Ottomans, if you read their biographies and whatnot, they are human beings who have that power and that wealth and their harims and all that you can imagine, their sharab and khamar, their, this is the reality of the ummah. Human beings are human beings. When you are tempted, you will fall prey to temptations. And the vast majority of Khulafa are living lifestyles of the rich and famous. The vast majority. The rare exceptions like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, that's why he's so famous. That he did it, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, you all know the, the one in the Umayyad time, right? That's why he's so famous, that he didn't live that lifestyle. But the fact of the matter is the majority of them, you could not even meet and greet them if you were a commoner like we are. They're beyond you. They have their magnificent palaces, whatnot. Umar ibn Khattab is still living the lifestyle of the, 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 the Prophet ﷺ. Access to everybody, living in this manner. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed uh, him in his time. And in fact, there's a, a very beautiful narration that I found very moving. And it's narrated by Imam Ahmad in a book that he wrote, not his Musnad. Imam Ahmad had written uh, around a dozen or so books. And he has a, a volume, a very beautiful volume, which is separate. And it is called Kitab al-Zuhd, the chapter of living ascetic or simple lives. And in this separate volume, he has chapters about narrations from all of the prophets, about the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and then about the Sahaba, how they lived. So he has a whole chapter about Umar al-Khattab, 10 pages about Umar al-Khattab in this chapter, in this book of Kitab al-Zuhd. Very beautiful. And one narration, I found it very, very moving, very touching. And it is mentioned in this Imam Ahmed's book. So it is a very authentic book of narrations. It is mentioned that once when Umar was the Khalifa, his daughter Hafsa came to visit him. And when she saw the state of affairs inside of his house and how little food that he had and the state of his clothes, she said, Ya Abata, father, Allah has blessed you with more than this. So why don't you dress in better clothes and have better food. So he said, I shall make you the judge of what you just said. Meaning, you will judge the validity of what you just said. Is it good or, or correct? Is it correct or incorrect? And then he began to remind her of the lifestyle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he brought up incidents and he reminded her of how her own husband used to live the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until Hafsa's eyes swelled up with tears and she began to cry. Then Umar said, I had two companions, meaning the process of Abu Bakr, who took a particular path. So if I take that same path of strictness and living austere life, I hope to meet up with my two companions 
who are now living the life of ease and comfort. Meaning, up there. Okay? If I follow their path now, I hope Allah combines me with them in the Akhirah. And I found this to be so moving because deja vu all over again. Deja vu from what? From which incident? What happens? Who said this to whom? And now the situation is being reversed. And who is the one who is now reversing the situation? Right? Look at how the table has turned. 15, 20 years ago, as a younger man, Umar is the one crying in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, surely you should live like better than this Kisra and, and, and Khusra or whatnot. Allah has given you more. And the Prophet ﷺ said, don't you want that Allah gives us the Akhirah and gives them this dunya? That impacted Umar. So that when Allah gave him the dunya, now the very wife of the Prophet ﷺ, the very wife of the man that he is in front of now, crying, 20 years later, his own daughter is now crying up in his presence. Ya Abata, why are you living like this? Right? And he reminds her, how did your husband or the Prophet ﷺ live? And she realizes, yes, and he says, if I live their lifestyle, I hope that I will join them in the Akhirah. And that really shows the, the, uh, the, the Iman of Umar bin Khattab and the fact that he really understands that it is the Akhirah that we are interested in. And truly, this narration, it also shows us the tarbiyah of Umar bin Khattab. The tarbiyah that the Prophet ﷺ gave. That it impacted him so much that now that he has the opportunity 20 years later to do as he pleases, he doesn't want to do that. And he continues to live that, that simple lifestyle. And it is also narrated in the same book of Muslim Imam, uh, Muslim Imam not Musna, sorry, Kitab al Zuhd of Imam Ahmad, that once in the, there was a famous uh, drought in Medina, it was called the uh, Amur Ramada, the, the, the drought, if you like, or the famine, the famine of Ramada. It was a famine where people could not eat. And on one occasion, when Umar was uh, giving the khutbah again, his stomach began uh, growling on the mimbar. And it was so loud the people could hear it. And he tapped his own stomach. And the word for growling in Arabic is qarqara. qarqara. So he said, qarqir aw la tu qarqir. Whether you grumble or growl or you don't grumble or growl, right? You shall remain hungry as long as the Muslims remain hungry. I mean, subhanAllah, just a slip in front of the people that he's telling his own stomach, you can growl as much as you want. When this year, that Amur Ramada, or this season, was a season there was a famine, and everybody was going hungry. Now, obviously, he is the Khalifa, he has access to wealth. He has access to Baytul Mal. But he felt that it is not fair for me to eat to my full when the people do not have their full. So he purposely ate as minimum amount to survive, just to be in sympathy with the rest of the ummah. And he says, qarqir aw la tu qarqir. Whether you grumble or not, doesn't matter. You're not going to get your fill until the people get their fill as well. And again, this demonstrates again the, 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 the sense that Umar has that I have to be conscious in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why that famous statement of Umar that hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu wa zinuha qabla an tuzana. The famous uh, statement of Umar, one of the most famous statements of Umar. Always take account of yourself before it will be taken account of by Allah and weigh your own deeds before they will be weighed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, another demonstration of his piety and his uh, humility was that Umar had a particular philosophy or a, a, a policy different than Abu Bakr. So pause here, you need to understand one thing that when all of this wealth comes in, all of this ghanima comes in from all across the Muslim world, so uh, Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu understood that the Sahaba who sacrificed so much for early Islam, they deserve shares from this wealth. So he distributed this ghanima to the Sahaba who were with the Prophet the, the, the ones who fought the battles and whatnot, they deserve this. Now that we're reaping all of this wealth, 
Who deserves it, number one? It is those who sacrificed 20, 30 years, well, 23 years, or, or those who sacrificed even the... So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu opened the door, this is Quranic and from the Sunnah, no problem, that you distribute a portion of the, uh, of the wealth. And the books of fiqh mention distributions and the madahib that's beyond our scope. But the point is, the Sahaba got a portion of this wealth. Now, who gets how much? Abu Bakr's uh, politics or siyasa was everybody shares the same amount. And when he was asked, why should we share the same? He said, how can I differentiate when Allah has made us in the ummatuk ummatun wahida? Okay, valid point. Understood. Who am I to know who's better, who's not better? We all divide equally, everybody gets the same amount. Okay. Umar ibn al-Khattab changed this rule. He said, no, I cannot give the Badri the same as those who uh, converted Amal al-Fatih. It's not fair, Umar al-Khattab said. How can I give the early one the same as I give the late one? So he had a, a detailed, if you like, categorization. Again, beyond the scope of our uh, talk here, long list of who gets what. And the number one category was Ummahat al-Mu'mineen. The highest share, the wives of the Prophet Number two were the earliest batch of converts. And then the middle batch of Makkah, and he was of the middle batch, right? And then the later batch, so even that, and then the Ansar, the Aqaba, and so he had a long list. So he himself was not of the top one or two. Yes, he was early convert, but there were people before him. And they got more than he did. And then, keep on going down, and people are getting smaller and smaller shares as they go down. So in one of these uh, distributions, his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, got 3,000 dinars. And Usama ibn Zayd was given 4,000 dinars. And you all know Usama. And Abdullah got irritated and he went to his father and said, Why does Usama get more than me? What has he done that I haven't done? We're supposed to be the same. Right? And what has his father done that you haven't done? Meaning you have done more than his father. Usama ibn Zayd. You all remember Usama ibn Zayd, right? And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, his father was more beloved to the Prophet ﷺ than your father, and he was more beloved to the Prophet ﷺ than you. He stopped complaining. He deserves more than you. And again, subhanAllah, as the Khalifa, he's giving his own son less than he gives somebody completely not related to him. And his own son gets angry, he goes, no. And this is justice, isn't it, right? That if you have that philosophy of having categories, Usama ibn Zayd is a higher category than you. Now, of course, Usama and Abdullah are similar age, and they're acquaintances and friends. So obviously, human nature, Abdullah feels, I deserve this as well. I've done this, I participated. And Abdullah participated in Uhud. He participated, he has a long list. So saying, what has Usama done that I haven't done? And so the pro he, he says, the Prophet ﷺ loved his father more than he loved me. And he loved him more than he loves you. He deserves more than you. And again, this is Adil. This is the justice that Umar al-Khattab had. Uh, also of the uh, politics of Umar al-Khattab, we all know that he was the one who chose the title Amir al-Mu'mineen. The first person to choose this title of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And there are a number of stories about this. Um, and perhaps the most famous one and perhaps the most authentic one was that when he was first uh, chosen and he became the Khalifa, so somebody said, Ya Khalifa ta Khalifa tu, Ya Khalifa ta Khalifa ta Rasulillah. Okay? That, O oh, Khalifa of the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah. Meaning, of course, that he is the Khalifa of Abu Bakr. Because Khalifa means the one who will rule in place of the one before. So now Umar is ruling in place of Abu Bakr, who was ruling in place of the Prophet. Okay? So, Ya Khalifa ta Khalifa tu Rasulillah. And Umar ibn Khattab said, if we continue this trend, we will keep on adding too many Khalifas. So he said, you are all Mu'mineen, and I am your leader, so call me Amir of the leader, of the, of the faithful. And in reality, this title is a very humble title, because you are praising the believers more than you're praising yourself. You are the leader of the Mu'mineen. You're one amongst them, but you just happen to be their leader. So Amir al-Mu'mineen was chosen by Umar ibn al-Khattab to be the title of the Khalifa. And this has uh, basic, it had remained uh, for the longest time in the Ummah to be, have the title of Amir al-Mu'mineen. As well, one of the things that Umar al-Khattab instituted, as we all know, was the calendar of Islam. 
the Hijri calendar. What year are we in right now? 1437 we are in. This calendar was instituted by Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the story for this goes that one time he was the judge in a dispute or a case and somebody presented him a paper that said the, the, the defendant or the, sorry, the plaintiff, he owes me so much money and it says he owes it to me in Sha'ban. And he hasn't paid it, Sha'ban has gone by. So he said, which Sha'ban? This year Sha'ban? Or the one coming up? Or maybe even a previous year? Who can prove which Sha'ban? There's no proof in the document. So what? Sha'ban of what? Who knows which Sha'ban? And so he said, we need to have a system of calendars, years. So he called the Sahaba and suggestions were given. Some of the Sahaba said, let's follow the Roman calendar. And he said, that is too long, goes back. So too long meaning is now 620 years. That was too long for them. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Somebody says, let's follow the Persian calendar. Let's import that in. He said, no, the Persian calendar, every time a king dies, they start a new calendar. Who's going to remember kings as they come and go? Because they had their own system. You know, every king would have his own calendar, every uh, whatnot. So they said, okay, let's have an Islamic calendar. Let's have our own calendar. Excellent. We all agree. Where should we begin the first year? So... Uh, and subhanAllah, every suggestion given dealt with the Prophet ﷺ. The Muslims, the, the Khulafa never had, I am so important that I begin everything. Whereas this is the way that most leaders and even later Khulafa had it. But the Khulafa al-Rashidun never even occurred to them that something to do with them should become the first year. Even though logically one would say, you know what, you're starting it, let's begin right now. But no, it didn't even cross their minds. They suggested three or four things. Each one of them was linked to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Someone suggested the year he was born. Another suggested the year he began preaching Islam. A third suggested the year he emigrated. A fourth suggested the year he died. These are the four suggestions given. Okay? And discussion continued until Umar said that the year of the Hijrah was the year that Allah brought Izzah to Islam. We will choose this as the date. So the year of the Hijrah was chosen as number one. Realize there is no zero in a calendar. Time doesn't have zero. Calendars begin with one, not zero. So the year of the Hijrah was chosen as number one. Because Umar decided that this was the time when Islam's, uh, uh, if you like, uh, prestige changed from being persecuted, the Muslims, to being now a dominant force. This was the most important uh, change that occurred. And so the Hijrah became the Hijrah, the year of the Hijrah. And therefore, uh, Umar ibn Khattab was the one who instituted the calendar. Now, why was Muharram chosen? There are two opinions given as to why uh, Muharram was chosen. The first opinion uh, is that Muharram was chosen because it is the first month after, now realize, pause here now. So there is no first month before Umar institutes the calendar. There is no concept of first, second. Ramadan was not the ninth month in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It was just a month of the year. There was no beginning and end, just perpetual. You know, there was no concept of Muharram being. Now that you have a calendar, you need a first month. There was no first month before this. So which month will be the first? By the way, there were suggestions uh, which month should be the first. And Ramadan was one of those suggestions, and others suggested other months, until finally Muharram was chosen. Why was Muharram chosen as the first month? Two opinions on this issue. The first opinion, historically why this occurred, and this is Ibn Hajar's opinion, and he mentions it in his Fath al-Bari, uh, and other scholars as well, that Ibn Hajar says that it was Muharram when the decision was made to do the Hijrah. So even though the Hijrah actually occurred in Rabi' al-Awwal, those were preparations. And it is Muharram when the Niyyah was made to do Hijrah. Why? Because the second Bay'atul Aqaba took place when? Which month did the second Bay'atul Aqaba take place? Dhul Hijjah. Because it was in the days of Mina. It was in the last days of Hajj. Right? And so... The second Bay'atul Aqaba is when the Prophet ﷺ is told you can go to Mecca, or sorry, Medina, and Allah gives him permission to go. And what is the first moon that is seen is Muharram. So, in essence, Muharram is when the niyyah is made that we're going to now do the hijrah. 
So Ibn Hajar said this is the reason. There's another interpretation that I personally uh, find more convincing, and both are convincing, but I find the second one more convincing. And that is that uh, we also find narrations uh, from some of the early scholars that mention that Muharram was chosen because the Sahaba, they did Hajj every single year. And <coughs> Umar did Hajj every year as well. And there was this notion, of course Islamic, that Hajj cleanses your sins and you begin anew. And when does Hajj finish? Dhul Hijjah. And when is the next month? Muharram. So it's as if Muharram is a new opportunity. Whatever has happened in the past, khalas, it's done. Now this is a new year, a new day, a new cycle. Ignore the past, don't dwell on the problems of the past. Think of the future. And Allah is giving you another opportunity to have a good year. This is another reason. And honestly, this one is more appealing to me uh, because Muharram really is linked more with the, the, the Hajj. Maybe one can say both opinions are valid. Allah knows best. We, don't, we haven't interviewed the Sahaba to know what was their motivation. But it appears the most logical one would be that it is understood and realized pretty much everybody's doing Hajj every year back then. You know, Medina is there, Makkah is right there. Everybody's going for Hajj. It's an annual event. So the notion is that now that I come back from Hajj, and it will take them 10 days to come back. Quite literally, they're arriving back home, you can say on the first of Muharram or a few days before. So the notion being that we now have a full brand new life ahead of us. And that's happening when? Every Muharram. So Muharram is chosen as the beginning of the uh, new year. And of course, uh, both opinions are valid and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, in the life of Umar as well, there are a number of very... Uh, interesting narrations about how he defended the purity of Islam, the purity of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And we already mentioned the incident of the Nile when they would sacrifice a virgin girl every year to appease the god of the Nile. And then Umar ibn Khattab, he wrote that letter. We already talked about that as well. Uh, and, and that clearly demonstrates, again, he's teaching the people Tawheed and Islam. There's also the famous statement reported by Imam al-Bukhari. It's actually a hadith in Bukhari, not a hadith, but a statement of Bukhari, that when Umar radiallahu anh is doing tawaf, peak season, hajj, thousands of people around him, he says out loud that when he kisses the black stone, he says that, I know you are a hajar. La tanfa'u wa la tadur. You are just a stone. You can neither help me nor benefit me. And were it not for the fact that the Prophet ﷺ kissed you and I saw him kiss you, I would not have kissed you. Now again, why is he saying this out loud in peak season as he's doing tawaf? To teach the people tawheed that even the Kaaba, its bricks are not holy. Even the Kaaba, its bricks are not holy. It is Allah's house. The place is holy. But not the bricks that in and of itself, just touching it will give you blessings. And that's why he publicly says this famous statement and it is reported in Sahih al-Bukhari. And it is also narrated in the Musannafat of the Razaq. And the Musannafat, by the way, uh, you should know these, uh, these titles. The Musannaf, there's two famous Musannafat. The, the Musannaf of uh, uh, Sanani and the Musannaf of uh, sorry, Abdul Razaq. And the, sorry, Abdul Razaq al-Sanani and the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. These are the two famous Musannafs. And the Musannaf works typically compile the statements and the actions of the Sahaba. So you have the Sahih and the Sunan works. These compile the statements and actions of the Prophet The Musannaf, and there's two famous ones. Other ones are missing or lost, but there are other tertiary ones, but there's two famous ones. The main point of the Musannaf is to compile the statements and actions of the Sahaba and also some of the famous Tabi'un, like the big Tabi'un, the early Tabi'un. So these are the Musannaf works. In the Musannaf Abdul Razak, it is mentioned that a group of pilgrims would stop at the location of Bay'atul Ridwan and rub their backs on the tree that the Prophet ﷺ sat under. And this news reached Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he commanded that the tree be cut down. That the tree be cut down. And this is an interesting narration because it demonstrates the natural tensions between wanting to connect with your holy figure and that connection potentially leading to that which is impermissible. So from the earliest of Islam, we have human beings, righteous people, technically they would be tabi'un because they're living at the time of the Sahaba. Their natural instinct, their Prophet Muhammad has sat under that tree. What do they feel like doing? 
They want to go and sit under that tree. And they're rubbing their backs, the same place where the Prophet ﷺ did it. And to be brutally honest, if me and you were there, we would do that as well. Correct? It's human nature. It's human nature. We would actually do more than this. Okay? It's human nature. And perhaps in and of itself, that is not that dangerous. But Umar ibn al-Khattab has the foresight to understand that this is a domino. And that this generation is just rubbing its back. Next generation will do something else. Third, fourth, fifth, and this tree will become an idol. There's no question that Umar ibn Khattab understood this. And all you need to do is to look at the state of the Muslim Ummah in many places in the world where blatant un-Islamic things take place at graves and at quote-unquote holy sites that are not even holy. It's not the process of it's Peer so-and-so or, or Sheikh so-and-so did something and that becomes a holy place, right? So Umar ibn Khattab understood this. He commanded the tree be cut down. And it is also narrated uh, in the Musannaf works that when he was going for Hajj once, he saw a long line of people in the distance, they're waiting to pray at a particular location. It's not a masjid, it's the middle of the place, it's just praying. So he asked, what is going on here? And he was told, this is the place where the Prophet ﷺ prayed once, so we all want to pray here. Now again, technically there's nothing wrong because it is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, technically there's nothing wrong with wanting to literally follow in his footsteps. I would say, this is my position actually, that from a purely theoretical standpoint, yeah, and you can pray anywhere, and if you find out that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed exactly at this location, you know, you want to go pray there. Umar ibn Khattab said, فَلَا تَفْعَلُوا Don't do this anymore. He forbade them. Because the people before you took the athar or the remnants and the footsteps of their prophets as places of worship and this caused them to go astray or to be destroyed so whenever the time for salah comes pray wherever you are now umar's point is absolutely valid as well and it is the more pure or authentic point correct that you know if you really think about it the Prophet says when he stopped to pray there, he did not intend to legislate for the rest of the Ummah to stop and pray there. That was just, he ha and the one who actually accompanied the Prophet ﷺ loved him more than those who didn't see him. But those who didn't see him, their love is, what can we say, overzealous and not as educated as the love of the Sahaba. Okay? And we see this tension from the very beginnings that now we see in some strands of Islam and we have various strands, each one is going this way and that way. So those strands that are more into these types of issues, you know, they can look back and say, you know what, these early people, they had the same emotions as us. But we also look back and we say, yes, they did. But in their time, the ones of knowledge said to them, don't do that. It's going astray. It is also narrated that uh, Abu Huraira, or in some versions, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came back from a journey and Umar ibn Khattab said, where did you go? Uh, you haven't been here for a few weeks. So he said, I want to visit Tur Sayna, where Allah spoke to Musa. This was just when they had conquered Egypt. I went to Tur Sayna. Umar ibn Khattab said, if I had known before you left, I would have forbidden you. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى المساجد الثلاث. You should not go traveling to a sacred journey other than three masajid. Masjid al-Haram, my masjid, and Masjid al-Aqsa. Meaning, there is no holy land that we travel to worship other than the three holy lands. And Turi Sayna is not on that list. Okay? So again, Umar al-Khattab is understanding that this is going to open the door. And here's the irony here. Turi Sayna is mentioned in the Quran. As a place of what? Allah speaking to Musa. How can you get holier than that? But Umar al Khattab said, no, we don't want to open this door of taking icons in the world and people going and, and traveling there. Imagine if this is to Turi Sayna, 
then how about the qabr of so and so or how about the you know this is again you just read these narrations and you understand Umar bin Khattab's basically long term uh, understanding of Tawheed <coughs> Ibn Kathir also mentions another incident that once when the Muslims conquered one of the lands of um, uh, Tustar um, in what is now basically the, the region of Iraq and, and onwards they came across the grave of the biblical prophet Daniel Daniel now of course Daniel is not mentioned in the Quran or Sunnah uh, but of course he's an Old Testament prophet and they conquered the city and there was the grave of Daniel and there are many things mentioned that they they seem to think this really was the grave uh, and the people of the city they had their stories and legends and when it was have a drought they would take the the Qabr out and whatnot so they had their stories and whatnot and this is a biblical prophet whom yeah, and even though the Quran doesn't mention my name, but we believe in the biblical prophets, right? Well, asbat, we can say this includes in all of them. So they said, what should we do with the body of Daniel? Daniel. And Umar ibn Khattab said that in the daytime, have the people, you know, your, your workers basically dig many, many graves. And he said more than 13 graves were dug in many places. Then at night when everybody's asleep and, and people don't expect this to happen, go and bury the body in one of those graves and then cover all of them up so that the people don't know which one it was buried in. So this is what Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was the uh, governor uh, of the region at the time. So this is what Abu Musa did, that they dug many, many, many graves. So nobody knows where it is. And then in the middle of the night, two people went and buried and then all the graves were covered. And so the grave was basically concealed. And again, this is the fiqh of Umar because he understands it is human nature. Once again, we see this tension that some of the people are hesitant. This is the body of an actual uh, prophet apparently and the local Christians are, are venerating it and, and whatnot. What do we do with it? Just, okay, it's not a part of our religion to venerate graves. So he gets rid of the, uh, the uh, qabr. And uh, therefore to this day we do, not know, we do not know the qabr of Daniel. By the way, footnote here, uh, Shaykh Hussain ibn Taymiyyah says that we do not know the location of any qabr, of any prophet other than our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All other Qabrs are legends that have no historical uh, and an actual basis to. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we all hear of rumors and legends of the Qabr of so-and-so and the Qabr of so-and-so. We actually don't know. These are all just myths and legends. The only Qabr that we know for a fact where it is, is the Qabr of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another demonstration of Umar bin Khattab's uh, fiqh uh, of, of, well by fiqh I mean here his, his basically knowledge of Iman and Tawheed the famous narration also in the Musannaf that he passed by when he's going for Hajj and he found a group of pilgrims from Yemen who had absolutely no belongings and pilgrims always have belongings you have to have camels, you have to have just all walking there and they would every once in a while pause and beg for food and then eat and what and, and go on. So Umar said what is Masha'anukum, what happened to you? Meaning, have you been robbed? What happened? So they said, نَحْنُ mutawakkilun. Tawakkul in Allah. We don't have anything. Because Allah will take care of us. نَحْنُ mutawakkilun. Meaning, we purposely didn't bring anything because we put our trust in Allah and Allah is going to provide for us. So it goes, لَا بَلْ أَنْتُمُ muttakilun. No. You are the people who are going to rely on others for your needs. Not mutawakkilun, right? You are going to have to beg others for your needs. The mutawakkil, he said, is the one who plants the seeds, then puts his trust in Allah. This is the statement of Umar. The mutawakkil is the one who plants the seeds, then puts his trust in Allah. And of course, we all know this, that tawakkul doesn't mean you do nothing. Tawakkul means you do everything that needs to be done and then put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as well, we see his iman and his knowledge of aqidah um, in a number of other instances where he forbade heretical ideas from spreading. There's a very famous narration of uh, Sabir, who's one of the converts who was spreading some bizarre ideas and questioning the Quran. And uh, he had heard about Sabir from Iraq, meaning he was from Iraq, and Umar had heard about him. And when he came one time to visit Medina, uh, Umar ibn Khattab said, are you that Sabir? Are you the one who's questioning these difficult questions of the Quran? Uh, and Sabir says, yes, that is me. So in the masjid publicly, Umar, you know, he had his famous staff all the time. He began hitting Sabir and saying, 
has, have your doubts gone yet? Have your doubts gone yet? Until after a while, Sabir said, that which was in my mind has now gone. Don't worry. Okay, I'm not going to ask again. And Sabir never asked. He, he was asking controversial questions to make the Muslims doubt. So all of that was finished. And again, this is Umar bin Khattab's method of preventing uh, these types of ideas spreading. It's also narrated that when he entered Jerusalem uh, and he gave the khutbah of Jumu'ah, so there was one of the bishops of, of, the, the, uh, 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 of obviously Christianity translating for him. He was listening to the khutbah and he began the khutbah as we all began the khutbah. In alhamdulillah, in ahmad wa-sa'inu, wa ma yudlillah fala hadiyala. Whoever Allah misguides, no one can uh, guide him, okay? And uh, the uh, proto-Catholic version of Christianity does not believe in predestination. Uh, Christianity itself has many, many divisions, and so you have the Calvinists on one side who are very much into predestination, and you have other trends as well, and this was called the Melkite Christianity. The Melkites were the proto proto uh, Roman Catholics, if you like. Of course, this is pre-Roman Catholicism. This is way before any of these notions exist. And so, this version of Christianity did not believe in predestination. So the bishop stood up in anger. That's his aqidah being insulted. And he goes, Allah does not misguide, or God does not misguide. And when it was translated back to Umar, what this man had said, he said, were it not for the fact that you and I have a treaty now, right? this heresy would not be tolerated and you would have been punished. Meaning, I'm warning you now, from now on, don't speak like this. So, in the land of Umar ibn Khattab, in the Khilaf of Umar, you cannot spread heretical ideas publicly. And this is mainstream Islam, that uh, freedom of speech is limited to that which is useful to the public. You cannot go and doubt Allah or, treat or teach heretical ideologies. As well, uh, when it comes to the worship of Umar al-Khattab, it is well known there are literally dozens of narrations of Umar al-Khattab breaking down in the salah, crying, sobbing. And this is again very interesting because this is, this is something that as a young man he's not associated with. Remember when, he was, when the Prophet was on his deathbed, it was Abu Bakr who was associated with crying, right? But with, with that responsibility comes that fear. And as Umar became the Khalifa, we see that as well his khushu' and salah has increased. And there are many, many narrations that he would begin crying in the salah. For example, one narration he was leading in, surat, uh, in, in Salat al-Fajr and he read Surah Yusuf. And Surah Yusuf, of course, is a very, very emotional surah. And when he got to the phrase of Ya'qub, after he had gone blind and after his children are making fun of him, and he says, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُ بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى الله. And he kept on repeating this verse until the sobs that overtook him, they said, could be heard in the very back of the Prophet's masjid. And uh, as well, once he was leading Surat Al-Isha, and he read Surat Al-Mu'minun, and Surat Al-Mu'minun has that very, very powerful verse, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ And he kept on repeating the verse to himself, over and over and over again until he broke down sobbing and crying. The translation, of course, is Allah is asking, do you think we created you for no reason and that you would not return unto us? So again, this is mutawatir and well known. As for the ijtihadat of Umar, the fiqh ijtihadat, because we have, uh, he ruled for 10 years, we have so many decisions, so many fiqh rulings, so many decrees, and honestly, that has been the topic of multiple PhD dissertations. There are dissertation that I myself have seen called the Aqdiyya uh, to Umar or the, the, the Qadha decisions of Umar al-Khattab. We have massive volumes. We don't have time nor even the interest. But for, even for an intermediate level class, there are some decisions that you should be aware of. And this is a bit of a legal discussion, but it is interesting. And it is also interesting from a sectarian perspective, especially when it comes to the first uh, issue. So the first fiqhi thing that we're going to talk about is that there is this notion or claim that Umar was the one who forbade the two mut'az. He forbade the two mut'az. Now what does this mean? In his lifetime, in his uh, caliphate, he announced that I'm going to forbid the two mut'az. The mut'a of women and the mut'a of hajj. And so he forbade them. Now, the mut'a of women is the notion that you can marry a, a lady with a time frame in the contract. And it is well known that this was allowed pre-Islam. And some of the early Sahaba uh, did in fact have mut'a nikah. And that uh, our Prophet 
tacitly approved it in the early part of Islam. Now, Sunni Islam agrees that the Prophet ﷺ forbade it before he passed away, multiple times. In Am al Khaybar, in uh, conquest of Mecca, he forbade Mut'a of Nisa. And this is the Sunni narrative. The non Sunni Shi'i narrative, as uh, most of you know, is that the Prophet ﷺ did not forbid Mut'a. Rather, it was Umar ibn al Khattab who forbade Mut'a. Okay? So this is the difference that takes place. And uh, they say that the Prophet ﷺ allowed it, so we should allow it. And so this is one of those uh, major sectarian differences between the Sunnah and the uh, Shia. Um, however, Umar ibn al Khattab did not forbid it uh, anew. He simply announced the prohibition and he said that that anybody who comes to me having done mut'at al-nikah, what he changed was he said I will punish him the same way as if this is zina. So if he's single, he'll be given the hundred lashes. If he's married, he's going to be executed. This is what Umar al-Khattab did. That he made the punishment of mut'a the same as Zina. He said, Muta'a is not marriage. And if the Prophet annulled Muta'a, then Umar's qada is valid. You understand the point here? It's not marriage, then what is it? Umar said it is in. That's what Umar did. As for the Muta'a of Hajj, the Muta'a of Hajj is Hajj Tamattu'. And the word Matta'a means to enjoy. So Muta'a to Nisa is enjoyment of women. Tamattu Hajj is called Tamattu Hajj. Why? Because the muhrim can enjoy women between the hajj and the umrah. I.e. he comes out of ihram. And he can have conjugal relations and then re-enter ihram. Right? That's what tamattu' means. Tamattu' means you do the umrah, then you get out of ihram, then you can remain married. Uh, remain married, excuse me. <laughs> that didn't come out right. You can uh, be intimate with your wife. And we hope you remain married, inshallah. We don't want you to do talaq between hajj and umrah. But you can uh, be intimate with your spouse and then re-enter ihram and then do the hajj. Correct? That's why tamattu' is called tamattu'. Now, Umar ibn al-Khattab forbade tamattu'. Why? How? Where does this come from? This is the subject of a number of discussions in the classical and modern scholars. And the fact of the matter, to be very simplistic, none of the madhahib really took this from Umar as a law. They took it as a policy. Policy is not law. They understood that Umar had a policy, siyasa, for whatever reason. And maybe one of the main reasons it is said that he, did, he didn't want the people to be lazy and not come for Umrah outside of Hajj. That people would not come for Umrah in other times of the year. Perhaps this is a reason. And there are other interpretations given as well. One interpretation is that uh, he didn't forbid it, he simply discouraged it. And there's a big difference between forbidding and discouraging. In any case, none of the madhahib took Umar's position as being binding. And all of the madhahib allow tamattu' as one of the three types of hajj. Tamattu' and qiran and ifrad. Right? But Umar forbade tamattu' of uh, hajj, or you can say discouraged it, depending on what, uh, what uh, version you understand in this regard. As well, we see that Umar ibn Khattab was very forward thinking, and he was not a blind literalist. He would actually think through the reasoning of the laws. And this is a very deep discussion, which again, beyond the scope of our class, but this is the discussion to this day. There are so many rulings of Umar ibn Khattab where he seems to go against the text because it doesn't make any sense to him that it cannot be applied now. And there are many instances. The most famous one that's always quoted is that the stealing. In this Amur Ramada, when there's a famine, when everybody's starving, right? People were stealing to feed their family, their wives and children. They're stealing. And the first case of this person being brought who had stole, and his excuse was, I'm dying, my kids are dying, I stole some food to feed them. And Umar ibn Khattab lifted the had penalty for the whole year or that whole season of the famine. Now, textually, the Quran or Sunnah does not have this clause in it that if somebody steals because they are feeding their family, then they should not be punished. It doesn't have it. But Umar understood that, you know what, this ruling doesn't make sense right now. So, he didn't do it. And this, of course, leads 
to the million dollar question, well, life's worth more than a million dollars, to what extent can we apply that same rationale when it comes to a text? And this tension remains alive to this day. And we have it between all strands of modern madahib and the madhabis and the all different schools and the progressive is a, a huge issue which honestly is not easy to get into. Because the text says X. But sometimes it just doesn't make sense to apply the text. So how strict do we have to be? That's the point of controversy to this day. As well, um, so the, the uh, people you give zakat to are eight. And Umar ibn Khattab said, one of these eight, we don't need to give to anymore. And that is Al-Mu'allafati Qulubuhum. The ones whom you win over. Umar said, that was done when Islam was weak and we needed their hearts. <laughs> now that Islam is what it is, <laughs> we don't need to bribe people. That's it. Let them go. Now again, the Quran and Sunnah does not have an expiration clause, does it? Right? Yet, Umar ibn Khattab understood, I don't need to follow this right now. So, these types of rulings, again, the question arises, to what extent can we as well pause or modify or change? And this is a very, very, very slippery slope. Because if you take it to a logical conclusion, the whole sharia will become null and void. Right? Whereas, if you close this door completely, and you're ultra-fanatic, ultra-literalist, ultra-fundamentalist, what happens? Honestly, with my, and to be very blunt, you become Taliban or ISIS. Okay? So, there has to be some middle ground here. Right? And that middle ground is the difficult thing that beyond the scope of our class, but my point being, Umar bin Khattab is clearly not an ultra-literalist. That's the point here. He's shown us that the laws of Islam have a reason. And if that reason doesn't seem to be being met, or there doesn't seem to be a reason to apply, well then guess what? We can not permanently throw it away, because he didn't, he didn't, there's no mansukh. Umar can't abrogate, can he? That's only Allah can abrogate. But he can say, right now, for my interim, for my khilafah, it doesn't make sense. Or for the year of the plague or the famine, it doesn't make sense. And so on and so forth. And uh, another landmark case that all of the madahib adopted as well, was that in, in his time, a murder was brought to him uh, that had occurred, uh, uh, in, in, that uh, it so happened that four people had conspired to kill a person, most likely for his money or something. So they all simultaneously uh, basically murdered him at night. And so they were caught, they were brought to Umar al-Khattab. Now the question arose, what is to be done? These are four people. And the Sharia says, nafs for a nafs. Which of these four's nafs should be taken? Umar made the decision that became pretty much the standard of Islam and that is that if they were all participating, they will all be killed. He was said, four people, you're going to kill four people for one. He said, Wallahi, if the people of Sana'a all united to kill one man, I would execute all people of Sana'a. Meaning Sana'a is a massive city, right? If the whole city, now this would be when they all simultaneously are actively participating in actually killing the person. And Umar said, I don't care. Four people, ten people, they participated in the murder. And they will all be executed. So he executed the first time in Islamic history. And then after this it became standard. All the madahib agreed that if multiple people are guilty in killing one person, they are all equally sharing the blame. We don't ask who did this? Who did that? They all conspired to kill and they all actively participated. So the blood is on all of their, all of their necks, right? So this is Umar's qada and it became a part of basically all of Islam. Um, another uh, very, very, very controversial issue and I guess with this we'll conclude, time is already up. The, but this issue is so, this is really the most controversial of the entire uh, aqdi of Umar bin Khattab which to this day is subject of much headaches for all of us students of knowledge and, 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 and ulama and scholars because people are so confused and that is the issue of the triple divorce. The triple divorce. And very briefly, this is a fiqh class, a different one. I don't have time for all of that. But you just know it happened in the time of Umar. And the whole controversy goes back to this issue of Umar bin Khattab and what exactly happened. So, to be very, very simplistic, there are two narratives. There are two narratives. 
Which one is valid is the whole point of controversy. The one narrative is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr As-Siddiq, the both of them, they considered a triple divorce to be one. And Umar ibn al-Khattab was the one who changed this policy and considered a triple divorce to be three. Now pause here. Does everybody know a triple divorce? A triple divorce. After how long? What is the period? Okay, so I'll explain. The triple divorce is when a husband says to his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And he says it in one gathering. Okay? So this is a triple divorce. Or you can say, he says, I divorce you three times. Okay? Or you can say, he says, I divorce you a triple divorce. In other words, the clear point is that he is wanting to divorce her multiple times in one sitting or gathering. Now, the technical or the realistic or the sunnah method of divorcing is that you give one divorce at one time. And by unanimous consensus, a man is sinful in the eyes of Allah for giving multiple divorces at one time. Okay? Because he has three opportunities for divorce. We know that. maratan. There are two that you can take her back at the third time. Khalas. Fala min ba'du. So there are three talaqs that you can do. Three strikes as we know. Three talaqs. And the point being, you're supposed to give a divorce if you want to. If it doesn't work out, then... Uh, if it does work out, bring her back in. Then if it doesn't work out, another time a second divorce, and then a third divorce. So that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to space it out if it really needs to be spaced out. Now, suppose a husband gets so angry that he wants to shut the door for having this wife be a part of his life ever in the future. In other words, he wants to be cruel and nasty and punish her. And he wants to shut the door permanently. That I'm never ever going to have anything to do with you. And it's impossible now for me to do that. And he does that in one gathering. One sitting meaning. One place at one time. Not spacing it out over a few months. They have another fight. You know that's the sharia wise. That's the ideal of the sharia. That you know they had a fight. They had to divorce. Then he got uh, regretful and he... Uh, wanted to bring her back, and then a few months later, another major uh, uh, fight, then another divorce. That's the way it should be. Suppose he got so angry, he wanted to shut the door, and he said, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Wanting to completely cancel out any opportunity for actual nikah after this. According to the first narrative, this triple divorce was considered one because you cannot have another divorce once she is already divorced. You have to wait until the first divorce basically finishes and you take her back or the nikah breaks away. Then the point comes you can perhaps give a second divorce. Clear? Right? You understand this point? The first narrative says that once he says I divorce you, he can say a million times, I divorce you, in that, in that gathering, in that living room, in that bedroom. It doesn't matter, because it's one divorce, and it's just like the lights, which you turned it off, khalas. doesn't matter, it's going to be off, until its whole idda expires, right? Until the lady's idda finishes, then he has the option of a second if he wants, marriage or whatnot. So this narrative says, Umar ibn Khattab was the first person to change this. And this understanding goes back to a hadith by Ibn Abbas that he says, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, and this is the crux of the argument. That, uh, that, كانت الطلاق في عهد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وفي عهد أبي بكر الصديق وفي سنتين من عهد عمر بن الخطاب الطلاق الثلاث واحدة. The talaq at the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Abu Bakr and the first two years of Umar, the triple talaq was considered واحدة, one. This is explicit in Sahih Muslim. 
The triple talaq was considered one. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab said, the people have been hasty regarding a matter that they had some leeway in. al nas. They are being hasty, they're being mean and nasty in a matter that Allah had given them leeway. In other words, it's a, a expression that basically means the people are taking advantage of a loophole and they're abusing the system. So to shut the loophole, why don't we enforce it on them? So he enforced it on them, Ibn Abbas said. Meaning what? Triple became triple. That's the first understanding. It is the predominant understanding. And then scholars differ. So this is understanding 1A, 1B. 1A, the four madahib. Since Umar did it, and the Sahaba agreed, and they had ijma', khalas, we will do it as well. So all four madahib have three equals three. Clear? All four madahib. This is the standard opinion of Sunni Islam. Three equals three when it comes to talaq. And their main point of evidence, Umar did it as qada, he instituted it as a nationwide philosophy of ruling, and the Sahaba all followed him, and nobody changed it after him. And Uthman and Ali, they followed along. That was the qada. End of story. Who are we to change when they've decided? Okay? Now, that's 1A. 1B, exact same narrative, but flip it around. If Umar decided it, that's not the sharia per se. That's ijtihad of Umar. So, why don't we go back to the asl, which is what the Prophet ﷺ did. Three equals one. This was Ibn Taymiyyah's position, and because of it, he was jailed. Because the other madhahib scholars said this is a bid'ah position, because it goes against the four madhahib. This is a, a bid'i position. And it is a position that has no basis in the madhahib. And you can't find any of the madhab scholars saying this. So they said this is a shad position that he should be jailed for. And of course, they were very jealous of Ibn Taymiyyah for many other reasons. And so they used this and they, and he went to jail for this fiqhi position of three talaq being one. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah gave this fatwa. His student, Ibn Qayyim, very beautifully defended it in a number of books. Ibn Taymiyyah as well has a treatise on it. And... Frankly, their evidences are very, very powerful. And in fact, the statement of Ibn Abbas is very clear. It's very explicit that the three talaq was considered one. Then Umar said, because the people are taking advantage, we will hold them account to it. So, فَأَمْضَاهُ عَلَيْهِمْ He considered three to be three. And Ibn Taymiyyah's position was, خلاص. Umar had the right to make his ishtihad. But that's not binding on the rest of the ummah till Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Ibn Taymiyyah's position has remained alive up until this day. And as you know, it remains a source of tension to this day. The madhabi scholars to this day say three equals three. And those who follow Ibn Taymiyyah say three equals one. And this is still a source of major tension. And it is something that... Unfortunately, I as well have to be getting involved in all the time when a sister comes. And, and this is the reality. I've given a whole khutbah about this, that wallahi, we, we, we think very much about and we talk a lot about the importance of marriage and, and how to get married. But divorce is a taboo. And we never tell our communities how to divorce. And unfortunately, because it's a taboo topic and we never talk about it, people don't know how to divorce. And they fall into major errors and problems. Both schools or both sides agree this is not how you should divorce. The ikhtilaf comes, what if you act foolish? And this is a statement of Ibn Abbas that uh, a man came and said, oh Ibn Abbas I was angry last night and I divorced my wife, the number of stars in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> oh Ibn Abbas, what do I do? Oh, Ibn Abbas, help me. And Ibn Abbas said that some of you acts in haste and anger and foolishness. And then the next day you come and you say, Yabna Ya Abbas, Yabna Ya Abbas, Yabna Ya Abbas. I cannot help you. You are the one who acted in this manner. Means he as well adopted Umar's fatwa because that was Umar's position. And it became the standard of the ummah. 
The point being though, that whatever position you follow, both sides agree, this is not the way you divorce. Divorce is not done on the spur of the moment. It's not done in haste. It's not done in anger. If you must divorce, then plan it out the way you planned your marriage out. Think it through. Pray istikhara. Make istishara. And do it the proper manner. Then you're not going to fall into this problem. Divorce should never be done on the spur of the moment, which unfortunately is the culture of the Muslim lands. Wallahi, this is one of the biggest musibas. That we don't know the etiquettes even of divorce. Yes, sometimes divorce has to take place. When it must be done, it should be given the same amount of thought. No, wallahi, it should be given more thought than the marriage itself. This is the sunnah. This is the sahaba's position. So that's why Umar al-Khattab, when he instituted this, what was his goal? Think about it. His goal was, O oh men, stop playing around with divorce. It's a big deal. Play, don't mess around with it. And he wanted to punish them for being foolish. Stop being foolish. Don't just say divorce, 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 and then think there's not going to be any consequences. This was the niyyah of Umar. And you know, it has a valid perspective. Now, when push comes to shove, I am sympathetic to Ibn Taymiyyah in this regard. And for me, clearly. And also, wallahi, you know, the man was foolish, but then we shouldn't punish his wife and children for his stupidity, which is what ends up happening. The man was foolish, he gives the triple divorce, then he comes the next day to me and to all of the Mashaikh. What do I do? What do I do? He's fatwa shopping for Ibn Taymiyyah. Who's going to give him that fatwa? And I know this, and we all know it. This is the reality. But his wife of 15, 20, 30 years, his children, whatnot, what are we going to do? Yeah, he was foolish, he acted in haste. Why should the whole family suffer? And I agree, Ibn Taymiyyah has a very, and Ibn, Ibn al Qayyim has like a huge section in his book, I'lam al Waqi'in and others, where he goes into such great detail that Wallah is very convincing to me and to many students. And this is also the standard fatwa of uh, Saudi Arabia in the court system. The courts all in Saudi Arabia, the triple is single. And somebody told me literally last week from the Azhar school, somebody told me that. Azhar has also adopted this position. I am, have not read it myself, but an Azhari Sheikh, last week I was, where was I, in some city, and I was talking this issue with them, and they told me, no, now even an Azhar has adopted this position, which I found very, very interesting, because Al Azhar is not pro Ibn Taymiyyah. But they understood that marriages are being ruined, that uh, this is a very controversial issue, and so they as well have adopted that the triple divorce is uh, considered single. Um, and therefore, according to that position, if you divorce triple or multiple times, you are sinful in the eyes of Allah, and you must repent, and you acted foolishly. But that will be counted as one. And that means that if this was your first divorce, you have two. But if it was your second or third, so again, you have to think about it, you know, like this. In any case, so Umar bin Khattab had this uh, position. The final very quick thing that we all know that Umar did as well when it comes to his fiqh rulings was he instituted the Salat al-Taraweeh. Salat al-Taraweeh. And this is, of course, a well-known incident where reported in Bukhari and many books that he came into the masjid of Ramadan at Ramadan one night and he saw lots of people praying. A lot of them by themselves, some of them with two, three, others with larger gatherings, and they would all go behind different Sahaba to pray. And he saw this confusion in the masjid, and he said it would make more sense if we combine them behind one Imam. And so he commanded Ubayy bin Ka'b to basically become the Taraweeh leader, and he said the famous statement, Ni'matil bid'atu hadihi, what a great bid'ah this is. And this statement itself has become the source of much controversy in later Islam. What did he mean by this? Is there something called bid'ah hasana? Uh, is there something called bid'ah sayya? Is there good bid'ah, bad bid'ah? What does, and that's a whole controversy of a theological nature, which beyond the scope of this class. But again, Umar bin Khattab was the one who instituted what we now consider Salat al-Taraweeh, and was the one who first, uh, if you like, made it an institutionalized thing. Of course, it can be said that he resurrected what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did, and this is also true. But at the same time, he made it official as something that the Ummah is going to be doing. It is also uh, narrated that he was the one who instituted 20 raka'at, and this is authentically narrated from him. And that is something that he 
began, and that is why 20 rak'at became very well known and famous across the Muslim world, uh, because it was the, the action of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. With that, we come to the end of today's talk. Inshallah ta'ala, we will continue Umar. We're still not done with Umar al-Khattab, maybe one more, maximum two, uh, and then inshallah ta'ala, we're done. 